The day after primary elections across the Magnolia State. This has come up a lot before we get to Mr. Barber. He's in the studio. We'll introduce him. In our situation, we had to vote Democrat uh, in, to vote for local offices. Any idea how to change that? And, yeah, how, how that would be changed would be to adopt open primaries. Right now, the parties essentially conduct the primaries and and uh, so you select a ballot uh, uh, that's affiliated with the party that you want to vote for in a primary. You have to wait to the general that you can select uh, across the parties. That's just the way our system works in Mississippi. And going back, Rhino, to the ranked choice voting system, that's a lot of what uh, it at least purports to do, which is eliminate party primaries, and eliminate runoffs. It's all done. One day the election is held. So, uh, And I've heard of that a lot from across the state. Henry, thanks for coming in. Sorry to, to get off on that uh, that tangent. But you, you've heard this too, right, haven't you, that people say, yeah, I voted. Because we have a lot of legacy, I would sure. say, local officials that uh, maybe are Democrats, but uh, at the statewide level, uh, clearly in the legislative level, Republicans dominate. Uh, our state's mostly Republican, just based on the turnout you can tabulate in the elections. But they get to the polls and they say, well, I want to vote for the Republican statewide, House members, et cetera, Senate, state Senate, um, the district offices. But I got a supervisor. I got a sheriff. I got a, 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 a sure. um, yeah, tax collector or something like that. That's been going on a long time. Yeah. You know, and people, you know, for decades have – Particularly Republican voters have decided, well, you know what? I'm in Hines County and big sheriff's race, and I'm, I'm going to vote in Democrat primary, yeah. where they typically might have voted in Republican primary. Um, I will say, though, that's, that is clearly changing. Um, and, I, and yesterday reinforced that. Uh, four years ago in the Republican primary reinforced that. Um, you know, we're probably going to have— 370 or so thousand people have voted, maybe maybe closer to 380. 383 is what it was four years ago in the Republican primary. Um, but one thing that is, was, it has really changed, it used to be, Gerard, if you wanted to run statewide for a Republican nomination, you didn't have to go very to many counties. You yeah. go to DeSoto. All right, I'm going to have to go to DeSoto. I'm going to go to Lee. I'm going to go down to the coast, and I'm going to go to Metro Jackson. Then that's those are your, you know, that's where all the votes are happening. I mean, look around at the results, and you look at uh, counties like Monroe, Grenada County. I mean, there several thousand folks, and all up in northeast Mississippi. Um, and and why is that? Because you got local Republican officials. And that's what really drives uh, turnout in 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 so many ways. Hmm. And so, for all these folks who are thinking about, man, I want to run in 2027, and I'm from Rankin, and they, you know, and you can't win unless you're from Rankin. I'm here to tell you, there's some truth to that, but that's changing, and more and more of the Republican primary is out in rural counties, and. It's just it's an interesting takeaway from from yesterday and just the trends that we've had over the last uh, few election cycles. Mm -hmm. And uh, it got reinforced yesterday. And what was an interesting primary day? It was. Indeed, it was. And, and just a thought I had there, Henry, is that that sounds like it's to some extent corresponds with what we're seeing on the national landscape that uh, we're sort of seeing a flip of who the typical Democrat and typical Republican was through the years. Would you agree? I think, there, I, I think, there's, I think there's truth in that. And, and the, the flip side of this, too, at the state level is, do you notice something about if you're a Democrat and you're, the nom and, and you're running for statewide office in Mississippi in 2019, how many of those Democrats had an opponent? How many? Any, you got a guess? How about not, zero? Okay. I knew it was not many. Zero, right? Zero. So the Democrat Party is in an unhealthy position. It is not healthy for a political party to 
not have competition. Sometimes competition hurts, and sometimes it's tough. Um, but as Chris McDaniel showed yesterday, you can come together at the end of it. Yeah. And and that's what that's what you know political parties need to happen. But the Democrat Party's got a real problem. And and I think you know if you look at Brandon Presley, um, you know he's going in against Tate in this general election. He had no opposition, and I will say the Democrat Executive Committee cleared the field for him, just like the DNC tried to clear the field for Hillary, and and the Democrats Biden. clearly <laughs> cleared the field in South Carolina for Biden to make sure that Bernie wasn't. Yep. And so the Democrat Party. I think in Mississippi has got real problems and their new chairman, um, you know, they better open up to competition. Competition has been good for America and it's, it, and it's not only good for America, it's good for our political parties. It's good for business. And anyway, but Henry, I mean, it starts at the top, the apparatus, it, it seems to be dysfunctional at this point. Does it not? It just doesn't seem to be well organized and well managed. I, I, I'm just calling it like I see it. I'm yeah. not trying to be critical, but it seems like they've had some, some turnover, some dysfunction there, and I think that is sort of bleeding down into their their efforts in, in uh, pl- placing candidates on the ballot. Yeah, it seemed like uh, Sam Hall was the ED of the Democrat Party, and the last time I remember the Democrat Party being relevant. Um, yeah. They really are. They're really struggling. And yeah, you I mean, it's an infrastructure thing. It's a leadership thing. Um, and Republicans, I, I think, I mean, you look at our, our races and um, if you're an incumbent, you know, a lot of them got a free pass in, in the primary. And that's that's not unusual. But some of our incumbents, of course, had competition and Delbert being Exhibit A. Yeah. Um, but I think the Republican Party is in a, a lot healthier position. And uh, like I say, I, uh, Senator McDaniel deserves credit for what he did last night to try to bring people together. Hey, you know what? We're like-minded. I might not agree with Delbert on everything, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to help the governor and I'm going to help all these Republicans win. And, and that's yeah. a healthy thing because we're a whole lot stronger if we work together. He did. He issued, uh, I saw the same thing, I'm sure you did, the campaign issued an an official statement, and he he made those points. A little different tone, I would say, than 14. Would you? Uh, Very different. different. He's grown. He's grown, and I I, I give him credit for that. I will say his his voter base has not grown, though. I mean, he essentially, if you look at 2014 against Cochran in that first primary, he got uh, about 152,000 votes. And in 18, when he ran against Cindy Hyde Smith and he had SBN and they were all in that special election, they're all yeah. in, in together. Um, he got about 100, and, I think, 57,000 votes. Yep. And he's going to end up, you know, maybe around 160 or you know, it's looking like. something, you know, maybe a little north of that. You know, but so not a lot of change. He he did, did not really grow his his base and I, I had some theories on on that but I, I you know I think you know to win the Republican nomination you number one you got to be conservative you got to connect with people and I think um, you have to be about policy and 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 you have to I think practice the politics of addition and not division yeah um, it's not always the case as President Trump showed but um, uh, but I, I tend to think that works better. Were you surprised at the number of votes uh, Miss Longino received? I'm looking at 18,791 with 92 percent in, 5.2 percent of the vote. Well, it's easy to, Gerard, for me to. Oh no, I was not surprised. <laughs> um, I, honestly, um, I, I guess a little bit, but I think. Considering this race and considering the candidates, no, it doesn't really surprise okay. me that there are about 5% of Republicans who voted yesterday that said, I'm not really for Delbert. I'm not really for Longino. Yeah. I'm going to vote for the nominee come November, but she not seems for like Delbert, a nice not lady. For, not for McDaniel. You said not for Longino. That's why they yeah, voted yeah, for Longino. Yeah, 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 they, yeah. They, they weren't excited about Chris or Delbert. Right. I, I tend to agree. Rhino had the same sort of thoughts, and it's the first thing that hit me. I, I just— 
I guess I tried to look at it a little too logically rather than emotionally and thinking no name ID, no money, no campaign apparatus. I didn't see her getting that many, but I think you're right. I think emotions came into play here, and people, I think, were just disgusted really with the whole ordeal and said, I'm just going to vote for somebody different. That happens. Lots of politics. Yeah, we got uh, Henry Barber, GOP strategist in the Element Well studio. We're coming. We're pleased to have Henry Barber, GOP strategist, as our guest. I want to pass this on. Representative Price Wallace in Simpson County says District 2 supervisor is in a runoff in, in Simpson County. I think somebody asked about that, didn't they, earlier, Rhino? So I just wanted to pass that on. Uh, curious, Paul's Appliance Repair says, how much power would a Democrat governor have over a majority Republican legislature? Many don't like the governor. Well, the, the power they have, Paul, keep in mind, would be the power of the veto pen. If uh, the Republicans sent legislation to the governor's mansion and the governor didn't like it, they certainly would have the prerogative of vetoing that legislation. But then, given the supermajorities that exist and expected to continue in the legislature in both chambers, they could then override the um, a, a veto. And, and governors know that. They, they count votes when that stuff comes their way. So what is it, two-thirds, I believe, to override a veto? Yep. In, yep. Henry? Yeah, yep. okay. Yep. So... They would be in pretty good shape, Republicans would, to get their legislation to the governor's mansion veto-proof. Now, they could not sign it, in which case in Mississippi, you can't remember the exact time frame, but after a certain number of days, it automatically becomes law if the governor does not act and sign. But the veto is uh, really is impotent if you've got supermajorities in the houses, in the legislature, in the Capitol, that say, okay, we're just going to vote to override your veto. This thing's law. I mean, that's the way that would work. So, But it's a good question, Paul. I hadn't really thought through that a lot, uh, Henry, the possibility of a Democrat governor and supermajority legislature. We do have that situation in some states, I believe. Louisiana. Yeah, exactly. Louisiana, good. Oh, yeah. They, good, good. They're shooting. Contentious. They're shooting him down all the time, <laughs> v, you know, overriding his veto. Yeah. And um, John Dale, is, is, uh, he's about to. Get to pack up there in the governor's mansion in, in Baton Rouge. Yep. And um, they'll have a new <laughs> new somebody. That's right. Interesting deal. So back to this lieutenant governor's race, I think we have to agree that that was the high profile um, one in the Republican primary. So you think about this concept of mandate. It's a mandate. You know, the Democrats really like to use this, Henry. They win by the slimmest of margins, and it's a mandate. This is what the people want. How, well, how do you feel about this? I mean, so the lieutenant governor goes out and wins by nine points, but as you indicated, still looking at maybe a 25,000, 30,000 vote delta between the lieutenant governor, who's, who's been declared the winner, and, and Chris McDaniel. Um, that's not a lot. I mean, when you think about a primary, so... How does that maybe affect the lieutenant governor's approach to governing in the next term? Well, the good news is for Delbert, he does get to govern. You know, he's, <laughs> That's just true. He, he's not heading to the House. Right. Um, so I, I, it's kind of what I expected. I mean, as as far as numbers, I, 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 I knew that Chris McDaniel had a real chance of, sure. of winning. Um but as far as how it affects, is that a mandate? Was this a Delbert Hoseman mandate? No, um, it was a Delbert Hoseman victory. Um, but you know, I don't know if anybody's talking about mandates. But um, he gets to be lieutenant governor again. He gets to run the Senate. That's yeah. a big deal. It is. And um, so, and when you figure that about forty-eight percent voted against him. Um, Hey, look, man, you know, it's kind of a toss up. It's I mean, half and half. He's just he's just several thousand votes away from a runoff and you know, in 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 a, a three week runoff, who knows what happens. Right. Um but he won. So he gets Fair to go, he gets to go to the Capitol and, <laughs> and, and and work with a new speaker and work with with um who I think will be reelected, Tate Reeves as governor. Yeah. Um so you know, big opportunity for his ideas. 
Gee. something that I caught <clears throat> last night, Henry, at, at, at Delbert's um, watch party. Of course, the late race was called late. We expected that, I think. And it was, heck, it was 11 o'clock before we heard from him. And, uh, of course, you, you're going to discuss – you're going to thank everybody. It's, it's, it's pretty routine. You're going to thank everybody. You're going to talk about your accomplishments, which you would expect to do. And then you're going to start discussing, here's what we're going to do in the next uh, term. And I noted that he talked about health care, nothing specific, but just need to address that issue in the state. Mental health care, campaign finance report reform, noticeably absent and I point this out because it was it was such a, a contentious uh, couple of issues in the campaign. Nothing about uh, taxes, income tax reform. Nothing about the ballot measure. And um, the the challenger, Chris McDaniel, placed that fairly consistently at the top of his priority list. So I'm just curious that we got half the state, I believe roughly half, that I think supported Mr. McDaniel because – they do uh, consider those to be priorities personally. And in the case of uh, Mr. Hoseman, he, he didn't even mention those. I was I was a um, little just, I guess, just took uh, note of that, shall we say. What yeah. do you think? Yeah. Well, I have to admit, um, I, I left the, the where I was watching just as he started. Okay. And, uh, and so – so you're telling me um, yeah. that's news to me. Um, that said, I, I mean, I take your point, your overall point, is, look, he won. He won by a lot. He won. Um, and the reality is Lieutenant Governor of Mississippi is really a very powerful position. Legislatively, the most powerful, arguably. Yeah, but there are those guys down there at the house, guys and gals, I should say. <laughs> and there's a new speaker. And and as we have seen, the Senate and the House will have to figure out how to come together. So he, uh, you know, I, of course, and then you got a governor. Um, I, I hope at the end of this election season that, the, you know, the governor and lieutenant governor and the, and the new speaker will all sit down and, and – and and prioritize what what matters to Mississippians. What what are the things that that we can do to make this state even better? You know, even exceeding you know some of the gains that we've made in education that we've been hearing about, um, and great uh, all time low unemployment and great investments being made that the governor's uh, talked a lot about. You know, how do we get beyond that? Because there's there's lots of things that need improving. Yeah. Um, so I hope, I hope uh, all three of those people will come together and have a really serious sit down thinking long term, what can we do? And for Tate, if he's reelected, which I, I expect he will be, um, you know, it's this his political swan song unless he decides to run you know, for federal office or wants to be a. Uh, legislator from Rankin County, which I kind of <laughs> doubt. Um, uh, you know, it's an opportunity for him. He doesn't have to, re- you know, right. face an election again. And and so, you know, I, I think it's an opportunity to think, uh, you know, out of the box and think big and think long term. And and you know what what's good for what's good for the people. Yeah, the lieutenant governor did, of course, reference uh, the need for improvements in education and infrastructure. I mean, it's, it's pretty standard, I would say, given that education consumes roughly half the budget and and uh, the special fund that runs our, our transportation is a big chunk of money as well. But I will just point this out, Henry, is that the governor, in his remarks, once again called for the elimination of the income tax. So, yeah, the governor made a point. Right. You know, he's been a a big proponent and advocate of that going back to the last campaign. Right. So he he made mention in his speech, I just, I I guess, observe that the lieutenant governor didn't say a word about that. Um, Well, I I, I think there's (laughs) – all three of them are going to get to sit down. Well, let's hope they do, though, because I don't think that happened the way it needed to last time. Would you agree? I, I certainly am not going to disagree. Okay. <laughs> um, 
it's it's a healthy thing. Yes. And and that's what that's what the voters need. That's what Mississippi needs. We yes. need we we got we're gonna have a great governor, we're gonna have a great speaker and great lieutenant governor and they can all come together and and uh make the people the priority all the people yeah and, and you know we got great leaders in the chambers too uh, sitting in well, the house and the senate oh for sure no yeah. doubt about it we, yep. so we and got some a great good team blood right so let's hope we can get some uh coalitions built and, and uh consensus created there and get stuff done you can hang around with us can you? oh yeah. yeah we got henry barber gop strategist talking about yesterday's election stay with us We've got uh, Henry Barber, GOP strategist here in the Element Well studio. So the the eight-plus point difference that separated uh, Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman from Chris McDaniel, who was just unable to pull it out. But you and I have talked about it. He is an incredibly talented individual. He can do more with less. Delbert, I think, had ten times the money, yet that's not reflected in the outcome. You know, if you if you look at the the dollars that each candidate had and what they invested there, what, what do you think? What what do you think put Delbert over the top there, Henry? Well, a few things. One, money. He had a significant financial advantage. Okay. Uh, you know, he had about four million dollars in his campaign, and I don't know how at, at the end of the day how much exactly they spent of that. He also he had a third party group which he took two of his political guys, Quentin Dickerson and Josh Gregory, and they put together an independent expenditure group that went negative early, basically the 1st of July. And, and I will say those were the most effective ads, and they didn't have the most amount of money in them. And I will say if, you know, Delbert's side made a mistake is they should have gotten a lot more money into what Quentin Dickerson and Josh Gregory were doing, they were on message. And if Delbert had had a similar message or earlier like that, he'd have been sitting at 55 and not 52, hmm. in my opinion. Interesting. Um, uh, the realtors uh, also uh, had a significant independent expenditure effort on behalf of Delbert. They focused on public safety and crime. It was all positive about Delbert's record. And, uh, you know, that that helps. So money overall and and and, and these independent uh, groups that work for them. Um, I, I also I mean, Chris McDaniel, more or less, he grew his numbers a little bit compared to what he had done in other statewide races, not significantly. And even if you look at. Uh, a few of his uh, key counties, and you compare it to, and I'm a nerd, so I've, I've done a little <laughs> bit of this, but if you compare the numbers that Chris got last night to the the runoff in 2014 against Cochran, in Jones County, last night he got 3,276 less votes than he got in that runoff. Okay. And in Forest County, he got about 2,500 less, 1,800 less in DeSoto County, and about 1,000 less in Pearl River. And those were all, hmm. you know, strong areas yeah, for, for him. him. Yeah. So point being, um, his base didn't perform at the same level that it quite did um, in in 14. Uh, but I certainly agree with you. Uh, Chris McDaniel – more than any politician that in probably the last 25 years in Mississippi can do more with less money. And he's an incredible performer. And, uh, and we saw that. Um, I do think he made a strategic mistake or whoever m made the decision to run the hit on the abortion clinic issue. Because I got to believe that Chris McDaniel and his team knew, okay, well, technically – they could say that, but they knew it wasn't. It was misleading. It wasn't true. And I and I think that was a I I, th I think that was a gift to Delbert because my view was at that point in the campaign, uh, Delbert's campaign kind of had the ads where he's all sitting on the bench and it's all positive and and, and I you know my view is that that didn't do a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but when this attack happened. Everything changed. Delbert was mad. I think Lynn 
Hoseman was mad, I think, and I think a lot of Republicans were reminded, oh, you know, okay, that's what McDaniel, you know, does. He likes to attack and in, in a way that might not be exactly construed as, hmm. as a fair hit. And I think it was a mistake. I think if 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 Chris McDaniel had not done that and stayed on um, more just basic conservative messaging, this race would have been closer. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So you think in this case maybe the the route that was chosen by the McDaniel campaign to to attack the lieutenant governor on that issue maybe had a negative impact on I the think, outcome. I think it. I think it. It, it almost For wo- it almost woke up. Um, Delbert and his people, and and I think sure. there were a lot of people who thought, well, the, Chris McDaniel can't beat Delbert, and then that happened. It kind of woke him up, um, and it and it changed the messaging that came out of the Delbert campaign, who had all the money. Yeah. And once that happened, it made it a lot more difficult for for Chris McDaniel to overcome the money spend because now the message was a contrast message or a hit message coming from Delbert. And so I think that was significant in preventing Chris to grow to grow his base. And so he kind of stuck at about where his base voters are. What about Madison County? We, we got, uh, which is a big county, and uh, we got within a week or so of the election, and uh, the mayor of uh, Madison, the city of Madison, Mary Hawkins Butler, who is uh, a very seasoned person in the political world and a very popular mayor. A force. A force, no doubt about it. Very influential. An institution. You no doubt about it. You have to take your hat off to her in that respect, and uh, likely will cruise to reelection uh, when that happens. So she comes out and uh, has this issue about the judicial redistricting with respect to the lieutenant governor, and 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 says she has it on on good authority that he would support splitting the district, the present circuit court district, with with uh, Rankin, and, and then comes out. It has a has a um, a discussion recorded on video at a big political luncheon here in Madison County last week. Comes out and says with Mr. McDaniel, who commits, "I will not do that." And then she comes out the next day or two and publishes a video, and we've all seen it. it's gone viral, saying, "I'm voting for Chris McDaniel." I can't tell you the number of people, Henry. I'm sure you know a lot of them too. That said, "Hey, if the mayor says this is who we got to support, that's who I'm supporting." But the outcome didn't really indicate that that was uh, a factor. Uh, Madison County went pretty handily uh, in favor of the lieutenant governor last time I checked. Yeah, Delbert got 67 percent of the vote, one of his best counties, if not his best county uh, in the state. I I will tell you, I I was like most people. When I saw Mayor Mary uh, do that, and I, and I saw the grip and grin event and kind of how that played. It, it looked like to me, ooh, not not a good way to finish. And, you know, Mayor Mary, as you say, has got qu- quite a following. No doubt. But I think to some degree maybe what we saw with the election results is she's got quite a following who love her. But she's also got a bunch of people in, rank, in Madison County who don't follow her lead politically. And so uh, I, I think what she did uh, boosted turnout in Madison County. And um, it, it seems like uh, it, it, it ended up helping Delbert. Um, but I wouldn't have said that a few days ago because I was thinking, man, this, this, this wasn't a good play. Me too. That's what I thought. Yeah. A lot, lot of people, I think, probably supported him in the first cycle in 19. I think peeled off for McDaniel simply because of the mayor's endorsement. Yeah, I will tell you one thing. I think Mayor Mary has made sure that Madison County will get treated differently in that redistricting. We, we shall see. But um, I agree. Madison County carries a lot of weight in the GOP primary, and, and which they demonstrated I agree. Uh, again. And, yesterday. and I'm not sure where you stand on this, but just in my casual conversations with members of the legislature, I don't really think it, it had a chance uh, sure. splitting the district, sure. regardless sure. of where the lieutenant I'm governor sure may was stand. Some talk, but yeah, yeah, I don't think that gets through. There's a lot of talk at the Capitol that never gets sure. anywhere because people figure out this is not what the people want. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
But elected officials, as you know, entertain and accept meetings with people who come to them with requests all the time. That's what they honestly, it's what they're there to do. That doesn't mean they're necessarily going to do what they're asking for. They'll take the meeting, they'll have the discussion, and all the while knowing I'm not on board with this. That's but, right. But, but be really polite. Yeah, professional and, and right. receptive and and um, uh, listen with with intensity and and make sure they understand the issue. But in their heart, no, that's not something I can get behind. It's part of governing, though, honestly. It's, it's healthy. Yeah. All right. When we come back, we're going to dig into the 2024 presidential cycle. Lots of stuff happening there. We got Henry Barber, GOP strategist, in the Element Radio. Henry Barber, GOP strategist, our guest. So, Henry, before we move on to the national scene, why are we unable to find any data on Democrat primary for governor? What did I miss there? I can't find any results. I, I guess nobody showed up. I, I mean, just says uncontested everywhere. Yeah, I yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I'm I'm pulling my numbers off the New York Times. It gets theirs from the AP. Me and, too. And if you call uh, Emily Pettis I, I, at AP, I'm sure she knows the numbers. Um, but it is it's, no numbers. It's weird because obviously we it would be interesting to know how many people voted in the democrat primary yesterday statewide and that and according to what i'm looking at henry the, in the times uh, reporting all the uncontested races just say uncontested there's no data yeah right i, I, I guess new york times was busy i, I don't know <laughs> but seems odd to me yeah seems weird all right so we got these presidential elections coming up and you know if uh, you look at the the present polling, you'd say Donald Trump's lapping the field and he's got it in the bag. We got a debate coming up in Milwaukee. We're less than a month away from that. Uh, candidate Mike Pence just earned the right to participate in that debate. Eight total candidates have qualified. At this point, we don't even know if Donald Trump is going to be among them, although he's qualified. Uh, how do you see this playing out? You gave me some interesting information about when the primaries get cranked up next January, right? And how, how does that look? Well, I, I, all right, like you say, um, Donald Trump's got a big lead according to the polls. But I, a point I want to make is, <coughs> excuse me, mm-hmm. if you look back, <laughs> if you, you look back, I'm, I think I'm okay. If you look back after the 22 cycle. Yeah. Donald Trump's candidates did not do very well. Ron DeSantis, you know, we're just going gangbusters in Florida. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, Ron DeSantis, a potential presidential candidate, mm-hmm. he kind of peaked at that time. And he got up in the, you know, 30, 40 percent kind of range. And Donald Trump came down into the 30s. And all of a sudden it looked like, oh, my gosh, you know, uh, thank you. Um, it You know, it looks like Trump's in trouble. And then he gets indicted and. And things changed, and 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 part of that was I think that you know DeSantis didn't really perform, and it's and, and it's interesting. DeSantis peaked before he ever got in the race. Uh, we'll see. He's it got sure a lot, he's got a lot of money left. We'll we'll see if they can fix he's something. He keeps firing over hundred million bucks. He keeps firring people, but <laughs> he did. He restructured but, his whole campaign team. But but the point I want to make is, I think there's right now there's about sixty percent of Republicans say oh, yeah I'd vote for Trump in the in the in the primary, but. I believe about half of them are really looking for new leadership. Hmm. They just today, when they, if they get a phone call, yeah, Trump, yeah, Trump, I love Trump. Um, but if you look at what happened after 22, that to me is proof that a lot of those people could be are are, are not 100 percent sold. Um, but we'll have we got a debate August 23rd in Milwaukee. And so we'll see if Donald Trump shows up. You can argue whether he should or he shouldn't, if, if that's in his interest. But but a couple points that I want to make. Yeah. Um, so at the convention, the Republican convention in Milwaukee in, uh, in next year, there will be 2,467 delegates. And you got to get a majority of those to win, so about 1,234. And – each state, Mississippi will have about 39 delegates. And uh, the early states, Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina, they all vote in January and February of next year. They get to go first. Okay. And then there's all this talk, Gerard, about, well, you know, if, if anybody's going to beat Trump, 
they've got to narrow it down kind of like the Democrats did for Biden last time, because if you have five or six or seven people running, they're going to split the vote. And, you know, Trump's going to for sure hold on to his 30 or 35 percent or so. Mm -hmm. Um, And the point I want to make is that all those people who are running for president in the Republican primary, um, DeSantis, Pence, whoever, um, you know, if they don't scratch, if they don't do well in Iowa or New Hampshire or Nevada, they need to go. And the reason is because the the next big primary date is March 5, which is just about a week after. And 34 percent of our delegates p- get picked on March 5, including Texas and California. And by two weeks after that, March 19, two thirds of our delegates will all be selected. That's very much in Trump's hmm. favor, yeah. and it, it. But it also means if the if the field is going to narrow, they better narrow in a hurry. Wow, and you got to have the money for the stay in power beyond that uh, as well. So yeah, yeah, totally interesting. Well, we we're going to have you come back in another time to talk about that. Of course, we got the big time governor's race coming up soon as well. Always a pleasure to see you, Henry. Thanks for coming in. Uh, enjoy your analysis and insight. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, brother. Yep. We got uh, Henry Barber, who's been our guest, GOP strategist. We're taking a break for Fox News Super Talk News. Coming right back in the Element Well Studio.